Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. I'd like to invite everyone listening tonight to close their eyes and think about the things that are different about their life today compared to one year ago today when Americans were enjoying our last normal week of life. Maybe there have been things that have changes changed in your commute, your work, or your pastimes. And if there have been, then you've probably heard lots of other folks talking about those changes because most of us have experienced them along with you. One thing which may have also changed, which has not been a frequent topic of public conversation, is your sex life. Tonight's speaker wants to fix that by addressing head on how the social isolation and loneliness brought on by this past year can be healed with sex positivity. Dr. Kelly Neff is a social psychologist who focuses on the intersection of psychology, consciousness, and human sexuality. Her book, Sex Positive, uses scientific sexology research, psychological theorizing, Eastern and Western philosophies, and stories from around the world to help millennials rewrite the story of their love lives. She's the founder of The Lucid Planet and the host of Lucid Planet Radio. Dr. Neff spent seven years as a psychology professor at Saddleback College, where she helped thousands of students learn about health, relationships, love, and sexuality. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Georgetown University before gaining her master's degree and PhD in social psychology from Claremont Graduate University. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly Neff to the Athenaeum. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is an honor to be here to talk about life and everything we've been through in these last 12 months. Um, and thank you for that introduction as well, because I didn't realize, yes, this is our last week of normal life happened a year ago. And in some ways, it feels like it just happened. And in other ways, it feels like it was 10 years ago, as is the way of grief and trauma and change. Um, so I was going to start this talk by um, just letting everybody know that um, there are some complex issues that we're going to talk about. And it's a slight trigger warning, only because we are talking about uh, sexuality and you know, social isolation, trauma, healing from trauma, um, breakups, difficult things that might be hard for some people. Um, so I just want to put that out there for everyone um, and let you know that, you know, in order to, as psychologists, you know, we have to face these things, but also that it can be troubling and triggering and traumatic as this whole last year really has been. Um, and I, I also filled the talk with memes. Um, hello, fellow kids. Maybe this is just, you know, how we can relate is one of the ways that I've been coping with my isolation and frustration and anger is through humor and kind of like the, the stupid collective shit posting humor of memes. So that's why I put it up here. What's everyone wearing to the one year anniversary of 14 days to flatten the curve? Because that's another part of this. We thought it would be temporary. We were not prepared um, and we just ended up in a very long slog. So um, with that being said, also just a word of strength. Um, everyone listening to this has made it through the hardest year of really all of our lifetimes, and we have made sacrifices, we have been hurt, we have suffered loss, and we are trying to heal. Um, you know, we say we're in this together, that's been kind of like one of the, the catchphrases, um, but we're, we've been incredibly alone um, and isolated as well, and the way that we have been together, how has that really worked, um, and what has that done to our psyches? So we're going to explore that topic and a lot more, um, and I also want to say that I don't have the answers. I am just conjecturing and I am coming up with ideas based on my experience as a social psychologist and based on the research. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, this talk can create an open dialogue and kind of a context to explore these ideas in your own life and share what you find with the world. So that being said, I had a little bit about my intro, but you guys already nailed it. Um, I will say that my book, Sex Positive, which I also have my copy of right here, um, it came out in February of 2020 and I was on tour and had to come home because of the virus. And 
you know, no one wanted to talk about anything positivity or sex when COVID came up, except for don't have sex. So I took this as an as a sign to kind of go introverted and introspective. And this is actually one of the first talks or interviews that I've done in months. And obviously I went to Claremont Graduate University and I have deep love for all things Claremont. So I was very happy to come and do this for Claremont McKenna. Yeah, it put me into an odd space of thinking, okay, well, my voice doesn't matter. No one wants to hear this right now. Um, and it took me a long time to kind of realize, no, people do want to hear it. They just need to understand it in, in the new context of this new world. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to offer you today. Um, so that being said, let's talk a little bit about the psychological effects of quarantine. Now, prior to COVID, there was very limited research on this. It was small sample sizes. It was lacking control groups. It was mostly related to H1N1 and um, previous pandemics. But what we know for a fact from looking at these meta-analyses of studies and also from living it, that the effects of quarantine are emotional disturbance, depression, stress, low mood, irritability, insomnia, post-traumatic stress symptoms, anger, difficulty focusing, and emotional exhaustion. <laughs> um, sounds like my last couple months, I don't know about you, but um, how many of these have you experienced or are you experiencing right now? And I want you to keep this in mind as we proceed through the talk. Now, Social isolation is defined in social psychology as the absence of social connection. And loneliness is defined as a subjective dissatisfaction with relationships. Prior to COVID, there were many meta-analyses and reviews of studies on social isolation and loneliness that showed that these two things lead to very poor health outcomes, including premature mortality, depression, cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, and higher engagement in unhealthy behaviors like smoking and physical inactivity. Um, they also, uh, Smith et al. recently talked about a meta-analysis showing that living alone, social isolation, and loneliness lead to earlier mortality and an elevated risk of 26 to 32%, which is similar to the established risk factors of obesity, substance abuse, and smoking cigarettes. And so this has been the line in social psychology for years, that social isolation is as bad for you as smoking cigarettes. That's pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Um, and research has traditionally focused on elderly patients because they're the most likely to be living in isolation and alone. You don't really get young adults living in isolation the way that we've experienced in this last year. But thanks to COVID, thanks COVID, um, we now have the opportunity to study this phenomenon in younger people. Um, and, oh, <laughs> uh, I also put some memes in here. Why am I feeling anxious for no reason? She thought to herself almost a year into the ongoing deadly global pandemic, which completely appended life as she knew it. Um, I also am asking, do you have the clothes piled on the chair depression or wear the same hoodie for four months depression or both? Again, humor sometimes about the things that hurt us is a great way to purge and express the way that we feel. Um, so <laughs> if we look at our mental health during COVID, what we find is that is, is absolutely shocking from an epidemiological perspective, from a practitioner's perspective, from a societal crisis perspective. Look at these stats. But compared with January to June 2019, where 11% of all adults had symptoms of an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder, now in January of 2021, 41% of adults, four in 10, now suffer from anxiety or depressive disorder. Um, and of course, this questionnaire doesn't gauge the severity of these disorders, but this is concerning, very concerning. Um, another poll also from, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Another poll from June, 2020 showed that 36% of adults had difficulty sleeping, 32% of difficulty eating, 12% were having issues with alcohol consumption and substance abuse, and I feel like this has probably gotten worse, and also just the worsening of all chronic conditions because of the worry and stress, um, you know, uh, and I'll mention it again, anxiety, it, it, the stress of anxiety, it kills um, our libido, all that adrenaline and cortisol um, can be really difficult, it, it can kill your joy of life too, so 
that being said, um, one of the, the saddest things, and you know, we're talking with a college age population, is that young adults age 18 to 24 have now been hit the hardest by the pandemic in terms of their mental health. Again, this is from December 2020 Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, you can see that 56% of adults age 18 to 24 now has, now re- meet the criteria for anxiety or depressive disorder. And that goes gradually down as people become older. Um, young adults, there was a study published in Nature as well, St. Clair et al., that young adults have the highest level of social isolation right now, um, which is leading to poor life satisfaction across all domains, work-related stress, lower trust of institutions, and higher levels of substance use as a coping strategies. Now, you might be saying, Dr. Kelly, we know this because we're living it, and I get that, but the fact that we've actually been able to start to study this phenomenon, um, it's so hard to even talk about what we're going going through alone, do research on it right now. Um, Now, why are young adults getting hit the hardest? Why? Um, And I think a lot of it has to do with this fear of the unknown and this uncertainty. And in social psychology, we look at uncertainty as a drive state, almost like cognitive dissonance, that when we feel uncertain, we are looking for answers to our uncertainty. And I think this is an evolutionary drive, perhaps. The issue is that we don't have any way of knowing what's coming. So Dr. Kevin Asher, who's a clinical psychologist from Syracuse University said that the fear of the unknown is the most fundamental fear of humanity. Um, And that uncertainty and group niche and Nitschke and nurture in 2013 explained how and, and found that uncertainty is the creator of anxiety. So it makes perfect sense that we have these high, huge levels of anxiety disorders when we're dealing with an incredibly uncertain situation. And that uncertainty may also underlie personality disorders, PTSD, and negative affect. Um, Dr. David Clark in Psychology Today said, and I quote, what is unique about pandemic uncertainty is the immense scale of the problem and its consequences. It has profoundly altered the everyday life of billions of people, its duration is unknown, and the long-term economic and social costs are unpredictable. Is this the beginning of a global societal collapse or the birth of a new era? I mean, that's how serious the uncertainty is. We don't know, and it feels like the former, but I hope it's the latter. Um, Now, in addition, uncertainty um, is also and anxiety are also driving suicidal ideation up. Um, Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services in June 2020 showed that calls to suicide hotlines are up 47% nationwide. This was during June. Um, and this, the uh, National Suicide Hotline Prevention Crisis Center, for example, was operating over three to 400% increase. Um, so it's great that people are calling for help, but it's also devastating that people are suffering this much um, during this time. And I wanted to put this in there because I mentioned Um, in the description that this talk is about coping and how we move forward and how we can can ground ourselves and sit with our feelings and feel good again. Um, That's really my goal as a mental health professional. Um, And I'm right there alongside everyone trying to find the answers to that too. Um, So Dr. David Clark, and also I want to say, I think you're doing a beautiful job figuring out some heavy shit, all of you, (laughs) everyone, all of us. Um, So One of the ways that we can help mitigate uncertainty is to be cognitive of our tolerance for uncertainty. So do you have a high tolerance for uncertainty or a low tolerance? If you have a low tolerance, it's good to be aware of that so that you can try to control your your thoughts and not focus so much on the future and the things that you can't control. Um, He also recommends to be specific about your uncertainty. So writing down your specific uncertain as opposed to just worried about everything like the global societal collapse and the environment but writing about very specific things that you worry about that maybe you you will or you could have some control over that that helps um also and again everyone says this it sounds like a platitude but the research shows living in the present focusing on today or next week rather than next year, focusing on the next hour or the next couple minutes rather than the next month. These are ways that we can start to bring that anxiety over uncertainty down. The other 
thing is to focus on your resiliency and what you've accomplished living through the hardest year of our lives, of our history. Um, you survived it. And a lot of people haven't. We've lost a lot of people and we've lost our loved ones and our friends and it's been tragic. So being here, um, it is a sign of strength and reminding yourself of that through affirmations, mantras, free writing is very important. Um, now, finally, the last piece of advice, which segues into the next section of the talk, is about staying connection. Um, that, and he actually says in his articles, Dr. Clark, that the tolerance of uncertainty erodes when we are in isolation. And that was before COVID. So now thinking about this, it's like, okay, that's made this year especially challenging. It's like a perfect storm for mental health crises. Um, so we have this search for connections and we need connection to function, particularly young adults. Um, and yet young adults are the most socially isolated, the most anxious, the most depressed, and, and the ones who are suffering the most, even though young adults are the ones that are on social media so frequently on the phones. So are we saying that online communication and interactions can substitute for the real thing or that they can't? And if they can, what is the cost to our psyches and our well-being when we've transitioned from a human to human contact um, species to an online virtual contact species? And I have a lot to say on this topic. But I want to start by asking if you watched the Social Dilemma movie on Netflix. They did a really great job at kind of capturing this idea of the algorithm that we are you are trapped in a feedback loop when you are on social media. Even when you search Google, you will get a different search result than someone else searching Google who is a different demographic in a different place. Um, so these are social media is is not, again like all media is not informative. It's designed to entertain and exploit, and in the case of social media and like Facebook to sell ads. So what's happening is this algorithm that's showing you things to keep you looking, and it might be things that make you angry or it might be things that you like. Um, but what happens is when when you see something you like, you get a dopamine rush and then you want it to continue. And when you share something and the people who are on your page like it, then you get another dopamine hit. Um, what's happening now is this has accelerated because everyone's spending so much time on social media because we have no other way of interacting. And I mean, people don't want to answer the phone. <laughs> um, you know, call, and calling is awkward. You know, it's a great way to still keep with the group and still keep in touch with everyone. Um, but it's leading to a lot of polarization because certain groups of people, and we saw this before the election, my goodness, which was also traumatic. And it's an um, but what we're seeing is this polarization where suddenly you have two groups of people that disagree so fiercely on something. And because you're not seeing the other group at all on your feed because the algorithm wants to give you things that you like. So it's almost believing that that other group doesn't exist, that it's only you, your group, only me, only us. When in reality, there's another group or maybe several other groups who feel the exact same way. Now, this is like a perfect storm when it comes to conflict. And we, we saw it unfold. I don't need to reiterate it, um, but that's, that's what's been happening. Um, that's why this happened, I, I believe, is the, the way that these social media sites operate with the content that they show you. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up is the nature of online interactions are inherently um, anonymous, invisible, and asynchronous. So that's a huge transition from being used to, you know, interacting with people in real life, you know, especially I'm an extrovert, used to being around people. Um, and so this dissociative anonymity, you know, means you, you don't really know who you're talking to online. The invisibility means people can be lurking and stalking your page and you don't even know who they are. They're just out there because you're just posting into the void. And then finally, the asynchronous nature of online communication, meaning I can say something and then someone else can drop a comment and I can come back. I can take all the time I need to plan what I'm gonna say. You know, I can you know, do an emotional hit and run where I make the comment and then I bounce and I never even look at the post again. I mean, it, it opens us up to kind of dehumanizing 
petty, bad behaviors that we already have those. We've been doing, we've been ghosting people first for millennia, but now, you know, we have a, a way easier way of doing it to many more people at once. Um, the other thing that is very frustrating about online social interactions is the lack of social cues like facial expression and body language. We have evolved to use social cues like uh, nonverbal social cues to understand and explain you know the nuances of behavior and we don't have that right now and when you do go out in public you don't have it either because of the mask um which i am all for wearing masks and safety but i i am a smiler and i talk and you know we have evolved to be able to read people's lips and read their faces and not being able to see a face whether you're online or in real life has created, I think, a feeling, again, of, of that social distance and isolation and um, kind of a, a lack of understanding of each other, which is why there's been so much conflict and drama um, on social media and beyond. The other thing that I hope you guys are not experiencing tonight is the glitching and the technical issues um, on Zoom that just disrupt the flow. I feel so awkward when I'm trying to have a conversation, a video chat online, because we're always jumping in at the same time or there's a delay. And it's just like, it it's, it's makes the whole experience for me at least incredibly frustrating. Um, of course, for those of us who are physical touch people, I am a physical touch person. There is also a high level of skin hunger for, for those of us, skin to skin contact, particularly those of us living alone. Um, it's that lack of physical touch can can feel very disorienting and dehumanizing. Um, and then finally, we're going through, we've seen it this last year, and again, I'm not going to dwell on it, but these outrage fixes is what psychologists are calling it, outrage fix, that we're so angry and we're so frustrated at life just being taken away that we're lashing out. And as a collective mob mentality, we are picking things to lash out at. And the issue with cancel culture to me is that there are many behaviors that should be canceled, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia. Um, there, there's lots of bad, bad behaviors out there that people deserve to be canceled for. However, we're going above and beyond because of this outrage fix. And um, it's it's it makes sense, but it's also a symptom of the media that we are being offered to connect with each other. And it's a symptom of where we are as, a, as an uncertain, anxious, disconnected society. So I have some, uh, I have two cancel culture memes here, which I don't, I hope you find them funny. Um, they're not intended to offend, but again, it's like, that's the problem. You can't speak your mind because, you know, what if you, what if someone wants to cancel you? But it's pretty easy to not get canceled if you don't say cancelable things. Um, but again, all that aside, um, th this one, I thought, I just thought this was so funny. I hate cancel culture. Imagine God canceling you because you did the wrong thing. The very first Bible story is God canceling two people over an apple. <laughs> um, and then the second one is society. You know, we thought we'd have flying cars. We thought all this and instead we're offended by the gender of Mr. Potato. However, I will say it's good to have a gender neutral potato. It shouldn't just be Mr. and Mrs. Potato. It's it's great. It sounds like, um, you know, Mr. Potato hasn't been canceled, but they have resolved this issue by being gender inclusive um, and, non, and there'll be a non-binary potato. So that works. All right. So um, one of the other really negative effects of COVID on our, our sexualities and our, our conversation and dialogue about sex is um, the, the negative effects, the sex negativity that has been able to rise. Um, there has been a huge increase in cyber sex trafficking and domestic violence in Asia. Um, I read an article that in Thailand, the incidences of cyber sex trafficking went up, I think like 40% in two months. Um, uh, I think that was in Thailand last May or March. Um, there's been also revenge porn and intimate abuse hotlines are lighting up, especially in the UK. Um, and they're saying it's due to people's increased emotions and the increased use of the internet and having no outlet um, because of all the breakups. Oh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, also, you know, there's been a huge upswing of people um, working, sex workers on OnlyFans, and they're being doxxed, harassed, slut shamed. Um, also, people in polyamorous or non-monogamous relationships being threatened and shamed. 
and also so the list goes on LGBTQ uh, plus youth who are being isolated, you know, teens isolated in an unsupported family environment, and also trans and non binary teens not having a gender affirming family member at home or having limited access to their medications and therapies because of COVID and because of unsupportive family. This is a really big issue. Um, there's also been a lack of access to mental health treatment, medications, and medical care across the board. Um, new laws in America that are trying to restrict family planning and access to abortion. And then um, there's also a, a huge amount of online ch child exploitation. And um, the commander of the New Jersey Internet Crime Against Children Task Force says that this is probably one of the biggest problems from a crime perspective that is facing our country right now. So we need to be vigilant to all of this happening and report it whenever we see it. And there's other things that we can do as well. Um, now, I want to bring up sex positivity here because, again, how can you be sex positive in the face of sex negativity? But um, we are under a lot of strain right now. And our, our dialogue about sex and our awareness of all of the sex negativity going on is very high. Um, it's palpable. So let me tell you a little bit about why I think that sex positivity can help us heal from all of this disconnection, anxiety, and rage that we feel. Um, the sex positive movement is a social, political, and philosophical movement that embraces sexuality and freedom of sexual expression with an emphasis on safety, boundaries, and consent. Now, it has been a long, heart battle to bring forward the idea that all people deserve sexual autonomy, freedom, and pleasure, regardless of their race, gender, or sexual orientation. And this is a reaction, this movement, to all of the outdated patriarchal, patriarchal, religious, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, racist structures that have permeated our culture for the last several hundred years. Um, it is not about turning a blind eye to sex, sex negativity or saying it doesn't exist. Sex positivity is about actively working to reduce the causes of sex negativity. Um, but again, how can we feel sex positive when we are so disconnected and we are so filled with uncertainty and anxiety? Um, so let's think about reframing sex positivity a little bit because, okay, think about everything that we're dealing with right now. How can you feel sex positive when being isolated with your partner is driving you crazy? When depression, anxiety, fear, and life stress just make it really hard to feel sexy. Remember that list from the start? All of those factors that we're living with, and now I'm also supposed to somehow feel good in my body and, and want to connect, but I do, I desperately want to connect. Um, also, you know, swapping bodily fluids in the time of COVID probably feels disgusting, gross, and unsafe to a lot of people, um, as with the thought of being close to people at all. And meeting new people in real life is not an option. Um, online harassment, doxing, and revenge porn are very real phenomena. You might feel agoraphobic um, after just being at home and, you know, going on a trip might just be too much, let alone like being around anyone. And we still want to respect safety and not transmit COVID. Um, there's also a risk of getting canceled or called out for, for going out or saying you're speaking your mind or getting in arguments about this stuff or even just going on a date. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's hard to feel sex. We think it's hard to be sex positive when there's so much negativity going on in our culture. However, one of the most important things about sex positivity that I always talk about because I feel like people miss it is that sex positivity isn't just about having sex. It's not even about feeling sexy. You can be asexual and be sex positive. Um, sex positivity is about autonomy over your sexual decision-making, autonomy over your body, setting healthy boundaries and valuing consent, loving and accepting your body, not apologizing for your gender identity, sexual identity kinks or sexual expression, supporting and accepting people's identities, choices and consenting lifestyles without judgment, including your own, not, not shaming or criticizing those who make choices that are different from your own, recognizing and communicating the fluidity that exists in our sex drives and in our sexual needs and desires, 
acknowledging that sexual pleasure extends way beyond intercourse and orgasm, and universal access to health services that are inclusive of race, gender, and sexual orientation. So that's what sex positivity is about. And that's why I, I put this meme here because I just think it's like, it's like a hot take. My kink is someone talking to me passionately about things they're interested in and teaching me about new subjects I'm not familiar with and exchanging knowledge to further enhance the entire relationship. That is a sex positive approach to relating. Um, notice there's nothing about sex, but it's still a sex positive approach. And I think that's the point that we're often missing when we take things very literally. Um, I also wanna say where it says at the bottom that these healthy attitudes about sex uphold the values of safety and the protection of vulnerable populations, which is huge. We need to do our part and we need to do as much as we can to stand up for vulnerable populations during this time because of the isolation. Um, <laughs> so, and again, <laughs> I thought these memes were so funny when they came out back when the pandemic started. Um, the CDC and Planned Parenthood and um, uh, all these national health organizations, they have very much taken a disease focused approach rather than a person focused approach to sexuality. What does that mean? So safe sex means no new partners or small cir circles of existing partners. Lots of instructions about, um, you know, safe sex practices, that, that New York public health memo that said no licking around the anus, it still sticks with me to this day. Um, you know, the focus on hygiene, hand washing, cleanliness, reduction of partners and masturbation being encouraged and preferred. And that's great. I'm, you know, we need that from a public health perspective, but what about from a person centered approach? Um, what are our needs to be grounded in this context? Like how, how because of this are our sexual experiences changing? And what does that mean for the future of sex, for our lives, for our ability to experience pleasure? Those are the questions that um, public health officials really don't have answers or don't care about. So I thought I would try to explore that a little bit. And in my book, I, I predicted a lot of the trends that are happening now. And what I believe is that this isn't like, oh, this pandemic's changed everything about sex. I believe it's actually just accelerated the evolution of what we think about sex. So, and that includes masturbation and self-stimulation, online dating, nudes and webcam sex, online sex works, sex, uh, sex toys are up hundreds of percent. Um, and my prediction was in my book that human human sex will become a thing of the past. We, eventually, we won't even want to have sex with another person. We'll be able to do it all through technology and self stimulation. So this is what's happening already. So we haven't changed sex as much as we've just accelerated the evolution of the change that was already happening. Um, like, did you know, for example, that millennials were actually having less sex than their partner, than their parents' generation did at the same age group. Um, we're already way more focused on um, self-stimulation and masturbation. Oh, and uh, and speaking of changes in sex, this is um, some shots from the drive-in strip clubs. This is another way of how things are changing. We still want that connection, but we can't get it. Um, the, the shot with the toilet paper with the grippy thing is, is like especially compelling to me, but this is the future. This is how, maybe, maybe not, maybe it'll all be holograms soon. Um, also, coronavirus porn is more contagious than the virus itself. I just thought that was, that was an actual headline. And I just thought that was absolutely hilarious. Um, and it's true, coronavirus. So we're looking for porn that also kind of articulates the experiences that we're having, which makes sense. Um, but I want to ask everyone out there to think about, you know, as we think about processing and sitting with our emotions, um, you know, how how they feel about this. For me as a physical touch person, I don't like this at all. Um, my love languages are touch, physical touch and chaos. <laughs> um, how do you feel about it? Now, okay, um, I want to mention body positivity. You are not alive just to pay bills and lose weight. Our bodies have changed. We have been locked inside. They have, we have not been able to use the gym for months. You know, we ate more. We were sedentary. We spent so long looking at the mirror, like you start to hate your face. I keep looking at myself in the mirror because I just want to see a person, <laughs> but it's it's terrible. Um, you know, our bodies have changed, but they've kept us alive. And one of the good things about COVID is that it has brought about a revolution of body positive images. 
um, and I think it's been really powerful from women owned brands from uh, brands owned by people of color. My, one of my favorites is this Rihanna one in the corner that she's even she's featuring finally plus size men in her ads who are just not represented. Um, so this has been one of the good things about COVID is that we're starting to really focus on body positivity and size inclusivity um, and inclusivity of all kinds. I also, I don't know, these are some of my mantras for body positivity. You almost have to tell yourself it's hacking your brain to a certain extent. Hating myself has never made me thin, but loving myself won't make me gain weight. Your weight will fluctuate, but your value will not. You do not exist to please the eyes of others. I am no longer available for, th for things that make me feel like shit. You don't need abs to be worthy, and I am learning to accept my body. I can choose to make choices that respect and honor my body today. Okay, um, I want to talk now about relationships and boundaries and communication for really the remainder of the talk and coping with grief. That's where we're going, and I'm going to fit it in in about 10 minutes somehow. <laughs> um, so here we have... Um, safety for online dating because what we don't realize is online dating is incredibly unsafe and it exposes people to huge levels of harassment one in three females and one in six men and over 50 percent of non-binary people were harassed on online dating apps in 2017 that's a quarter of all users how were how much worse do you think it is now um also there was a study in 2017 of 1300 college students and they show, it showed that people who were on Tinder scored significantly lower on measures of self-worth, including body satisfaction, self-esteem, body shame, and self-objectifications, and that men's scores were the lowest. So you can see here, like the safest website is probably OkCupid if you are on online dating. Um, but um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But we are not teaching people how to be safe online, um, negotiating enthusiastic consent online, including for sharing nudes, recognizing the red flags of information like the lack of information, unclear photos, and profile texts that indicate sexism, racism, and other undesirable qualities, um, tools to identify and report cyber sex trafficking, and that's the link right there to the Cyber Civil Rights Org. Um, if you email me as well at the end of the talk, I can send you all of my links, all of my resources to everything. I'd be happy to do that for anyone who wants it. Um, real quickly here, keeping your information safe online, avoid sites and apps that let anyone message you, pay attention to your geography settings, make sure your location is off, use unique photos for online dating so they can't be found by reverse photo lookup, avoid putting lots of details on your profile, use the dating apps messenger system rather than your email, text, or socials, set up a Google voice, Talk to mutual friends on the app about this person. Get to know them, but don't share too many details at first. And then in the real world, arrange your own transportation, meet in a public place for your first date, stay aware and alert, enlist the help of a friend, keep an emergency cash stash on hand and carry a self-defense tool, which could be anything from a whistle to a flashlight um, or something that's more hardcore, depending on your comfort level. But we have to be safe. There's just too much going on here that, that's not being addressed. Um, from a public health person-centered perspective, online dating websites have a lot of work to do that they're not doing. They need to be explicitly calling out race, sexual orientation, and gender-based barriers to participating in online dating. They need to be providing individuals with directions on how to support these behaviors. They should not just include, they, sh they need to be reducing the stigma of alternative sexual practices. They're not doing that. They should also be addressing internalized biases that may deter people from seeking sexual health services. And they need to provide marginalized populations, populations with grants and resources to ensure that everyone has the ability to have safe sex, both online and in person. Um, this is very important. Okay, so how do we bring our sex drives back? right after this pandemic i mean is it even is it even possible to bring our sex drives back um you know think about it like this it's good to normalize low sex drives because for a lot of us um it's it's very hard to feel sexy with this anxiety cortisol disconnection type situation um were did you have a low sex drive before the pandemic 
Um, if so, it's good to like slowly bring yourself back in. If it was really high and now it's low and that disparity is bothering you, again, there are things that you can do to carve out your own pleasure time. That's really important. So actually schedule it in and you're going to experiment. You know, maybe you're going to put on a sexy outfit and watch a sexy film or try a new sex toy. Um, do movement, do somatic therapy, engage in behaviors that can bring flow to your space or put something soft and sensual in, in your bed or even platonically cuddle with a friend in your quarantine. That's great too. Um, now, if you have a partner, a lot of what's happening is distress and anxiety is lowering people's sex drives. You're together 24 seven, the mystery is gone. There's no space. So it's, it's really important to schedule your sex time with your partner as well. It used to be, you could just kind of pop in and do it, but because of the way our routines have been so disrupted, um, you know, getting sex cards or dice or doing something different, um, I think is a really good way of ensuring that There'll, there'll still be some spark left at the end of all this. Um, and I loved this idea of erotic empathy. Stop rejecting your partner when you're rejecting yourself. You need to allow your partner to find you attractive even when you don't feel you are. You don't have to believe you are sexy to be aroused by someone else or for someone else to find you sexy. What a, what a great message. Um, because we're slowly getting that body positivity back. Um, and then there's also a group of people that have been having nothing but sex this whole time. Um, sex makes us happier in a very Freudian way. It makes sense that with your mortality threatened to be horny. Um, so that's great too. Again, sex positivity is about accepting where everyone is at and knowing there isn't a one size fits all approach to sexuality. Um, something else that's really important is communication in space. So like I said, um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing slut huts, man caves, she sheds, whatever, um, popping up. If you can create an, another space that's yours away from your partner, if you're living with a long-term partner, like many of us are, or partners, um, also even more important if you're polyamorous to be scheduling that time and creating those spaces. Um, also, you know, taking time alone, people are craving romance and intimacy, but they're stuck together, stressed out, arguing. Um, this little quote here over on the bottom, just learning now, you know, do we want, do you want to vent or do you want advice? I say that to everyone, my partner, my friends, everyone, do you want to vent or do you want advice? This will save you a, a huge amount of conflict in your life. And also sometimes you just literally have nothing to say and that's okay too. Um, one of the other issues that we're seeing is just so many breakups. Um, breakups are on the rise like never before. I think one firm in the UK said they were up 122% on the year before. Um, same with this statistic about newlyweds especially are getting divorced. Um, and why? Well, you know, the pandemic has accelerated and accentuated a lot of pre-existing problems. Also, there has been increase in mental health problems and substance abuse, major shifts in the household health and family dynamics, the loss of well-established routines that offer our comfort and stability. When those are gone, a lot of the time the relationship collapses. So if you, if you went through a breakup, you might feel alone, but you're not. Um, also, this for a lot of newlyweds, this is like one of the first, they weren't battle tested, they had never been through conflict, and what a doozy to be thrust into. Um, financial stress also always destroys relationships. Um, every depression we've ever had has seen more divorce, but then when people's finances get back up, um, experts are predicting that there will be even more breakups that they're actually getting, they're collecting information right now from lawyers, and once they have the money and life is back, they're getting divorced. And also this COVID, this pandemic has created an existential crisis and a reevaluation of our goals and our needs. Well, who, who, what, is, what am I living for? Who do I wanna be in my life? You know, when your mortality is threatened, you ask these kinds of questions. Um, I also put this slide in there just because I want everyone to take a moment to read it, to think about boundaries in communication. Boundaries is a key tenant of sex positivity. And um, this, this applies not only to um, sex, but to all of our relationships, our jobs, everything. Feeling safe to express yourself, saying no without guilt, accepting when others say no, being in charge of your own happiness, not anticipating the needs of others, clearly communicating your wants and needs, acting in alignment with your beliefs. 
Um, and what boundaries sound like. If you continue to speak to me that way, I will end this conversation. A lot of us are such people pleasers um, and we have a really hard time saying no, but learning to say no is incredibly empowering and actually a form of self-love. Um, and no is a complete sentence as well. Um, also, boundaries feel yucky and hard and uncomfortable, but with time you will have improved self-esteem, better autonomy, less burnout and improved emotional health. Now, I also want to talk about um, grief because we are essentially grieving the loss of our lives right now. And this is a, a fluid process of going from denial to bargaining, to anger, to depression, to acceptance, to finding meaning and back around again. I'm sure many of you out there, especially in psychology, are familiar with David Kessler and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, um, or the high level escape room concept of laying in bed and trying to get out of bed. And often it, it's because we're actually feeling very heavy grief. Um, I love this quote, grief is like the ocean. It comes on waves ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes it is overwhelming, but all we can do is learn to swim. And um, one of the best things we could do is positively impact people's lives and know we are grieving and find gratitude for what we do have. And as, again, it sounds like a platitude, but that's really what psychology tells us works is gratitude, not taking things personally, focusing on the moment, doing something to create happiness for people and knowing that your best is enough, even if it doesn't compare to your pre-pandemic best. Finally, um, one of the most important things that we've learned during the pandemic is how to cope and to sit with our feelings. And when it comes to sex positivity, how do you feel about your body, your gender, your sexual orientation, your sexual needs and desires? Can you sit with that? Can you accept the changes you have experienced over the last 12 months? Are you in a safe place to process these emotions? Can you sit with the feeling without distracting yourself? And I mentioned um, you have a really great tent. This is where I would want to sit and, and think about my feelings as this vagina tent. Um, and also this meme made me laugh, buy a new candle, take a shower, drink coffee until you puke, overshare online and scream. That's how a lot of us have been processing, maybe not exactly like that, but um, yeah. And then something else that I think is really important is um, substance use, you know, if you want to impress me, don't drink, sit with your feelings and improve your life. And it's really hard to do right now. Um, instead of saying I'm damaged, I'm broken, say I'm healing, I'm rediscovering, I'm starting over. And then also this little graphic about sitting with resist, sitting with discomfort and sitting with your pain and your loss and your trauma, it sucks. But over time, that resistance, that yuckiness will go away. If you say, I am, you're welcome here, feelings, it'll feel your body relax. And this works um, for everything, but especially when it comes to sexuality and all of the, our sexual issues that we're going through right now. Um, finally, these are just some of my other tools for healing. Um, fresh air, exercise, positive mantra to hack your brain, meditation and breathing also to hack your brain art and activities that can bring you into a state of flow, um, taking breaks from social media, learning a new skill, adopting animals or playing with animals, orgasms and masturbation, always good, great for your health, humor and making fun of things and making fun of yourself, free writing and then plant medicine and adaptogenic herbs have helped me a lot to get through this. Um, also helping others is such an important part of being able to to cope with our social isolation right now. So standing up against transphobia, homophobia, and racism, helping to provide mental health resources and access to safe sex resources, um, you know, and having safe sex and passing that on that that is the only thing that we have to do. We, mu we must have safe, safe, safe sex. Creating responsible dialogues about our online safety and protecting people online and reaching out to your friends and loved ones. So I think that's all I have time for today. Um, I want to say as just a reminder, you are worthy of love and you can tell yourself these affirmations. You can write them down. You can scream them out loud. You can write it on a mirror. It is something that has helped me tremendously. And thank you so much again, um, to Claremont McKenna, Priya, um, Gail, and, um, here Here's my email. If you need any resources or references for any of the topics in this talk, I'd be more than happy to provide them. And um, Dr. Kelly Neff on the socials if you want to stay in touch there. So 
thank you guys so much. I hope you had some fun and learned some things and feel a little better about how crappy everything has been. Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, so the first question comes from a student and they're asking, um, so you mentioned that you think cancel culture is going above and beyond and that you can't speak your mind because someone might cancel you. But you also said that most cancellations are yeah. done for legitimate reasons. Um, yep. So could you point to any notable cases of someone whose cancellation was above and beyond? That's a good question. And you know, nothing comes to mind right now I, because a lot of it, it's not cancel, it's cancel culture, it's like accountability. A lot of people have been held accountable and made the right apologies and they haven't been canceled. Um, but yeah, most, like I said, and again, I feel about this topic, the ambivalence that I think most people feel, which is we want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves from people who are racist and transphobic and homophobic and that they shouldn't be allowed to have these platforms. Um, that's so the, all of those cancellations, I support 110%. Um, I guess when I said it went above and beyond, what I really was referring to was an article I read recently about how one of the hallmarks of a free society is being able to speak your mind but people's fear over speaking their mind over being canceled. But it's one of those catch 22s. If you're not saying anything cancelable, then why should you be afraid of speaking your mind? And yet, I think many people still are kind of afraid. I mean, how many times have you written a post or, or written a response to someone and then deleted it? Maybe you weren't afraid of being canceled. Maybe you just weren't sure that it would be taken in the right or wrong way. Like we're kind of, we all feel a little bit unsure about what we can say and what we can't say, even though we know that we have very clear boundaries about what is right and what is wrong. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a really great question and an interesting topic. And I'm, I'm curious to see how this unfolds as we start to kind of make sense of it. Next question is about what you mentioned with online dating platforms. Uh, what existing features on those platforms are heteronormative and transphobic? Um, a lot of them. And that's one of the issues kind of that I that I brought up is that online dating is quite, and racist as well, if we're going to say it. Um, online dating is incredibly heteronormative and transphobic and racist. There's, in terms of like harassment, and I've been doing um, research for this talk, um, there's so many people that are saying, you know, if you, all you have to do is go read for these stories of people, they're like, oh, I don't date Asians, or I only date black guys, or like, there, there's so much of that on dating platforms, and it is really harmful. And online dating platforms need to do a better job of regulating this, I believe, they need to be protecting people. Um, also, the fact that there's so much harassment towards um, trans and non binary people on online dating. Um, again, it's extremely upsetting. And th th it is up to people to self-regulate, but it's really up to the platform itself to become more cognizant of safety for these marginalized groups and to protect them. Thank you. So another, there's another um, kind of follow-up question to the, the cancel culture question. Um, yeah. So what, um, yeah, this person just wants to know what you think of the, the shaming aspects around cancel culture. Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's part of this whole outrage fix. Like we have this, we have a, this a huge amount of pent up aggression right now, right? We're so frustrated and angry. And so I think the shaming aspect is coming from that. I don't know, would it be as bad if we weren't in a pandemic? That's the question. And I, I think shaming and 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 the, the really nasty, horrible, toxic stuff that comes behind it, um, like death threats and threatening people's families and um, all of that. Again, it's because we are we are like literally so divided and we're so upset and, and angry. But do I think it's right? No. Do I think like I said, I prefer accountability culture where we actually would hold each other. People can hold each other accountable as a community and focus on healing and rehabilitation um, rather than just like discarding someone and threatening to kill them and their whole family. What advice do you have for ensuring that hookups are safe, not only from STIs as we normally think about them, but also in terms of coronavirus and limiting the number of people you're in contact with? <sighs> I mean, it's a, that's a wonderful question. And, you know, the, the, the drug policy or the, the health policy answer is the only safe hookup is to not have sex and to not hook up. Right. So that's why we end up online. And yet then there's all these other risks to our safety, even virtually when it comes to people doxing us or harassing us or stalking or bullying online too. 
So um, how do we ensure a hookup is safe? Well, I mean, first of all, open and honest communication is number one. We all have our boundaries for what we believe is a safe level of human contact. And I always would err on the side of caution, but we want to make sure that someone's telling you just like it is for STIs. And this is very much the sex positive approach. You need to be able to disclose whether you have an STI. You need to be able to disclose. It's kind of the same. Like if you've been going on dates every night and you're lying about that, that is unethical. So we need to make sure that our partners are responsible in that way. Um, do I think it's safe to hook up? I don't know, not really. I mean, it depends. If you're with someone and you're, all, you're exclusive and you quarantine and you don't see other people, maybe, but um, we, you know, nothing is really safe in this world anymore. And that's part of like the fear and the uncertainty and the anxiety that we're all experiencing right now. So um, obviously this year, a lot of students have been at home with their families and um, some may have families uh, or relatives, whoever they live with, who are maybe not as sex positive as them or as they'd like for them to be. Yeah. What advice do you have for, um, I guess, students to kind of um, have conversations about sex positivity with family members? Um, well, first of all, no. <laughs> um, that's, it's, it's a huge, it's hugely important right now to learn to create dialogues and a lot of the difference, um, it, it's a generational thing that the older generations, just the word sex was kind of like um, a dirty word and talking about it in, in, a, in a health way, in a healthy way was not acceptable. So sometimes there's going to be resistance no matter what you do from families. And it also has to do with their levels of religiosity and conservatism and other traits. So if you're in one of those situations, um, I say it's still really important to bring it up, but maybe bring it up in a different kind of a way of like, hey, I wanna to talk to you about this thing about myself, not to be vulgar, but because it's important to me and I wanna be able to share with you and feel comfortable um, taking that kind of approach rather than, I think a lot of us, you're, you're stuck at home, you want to just kind of ram it in their face. Like you got to see me for who I am. And I'm also for, I'm for that approach too, honestly. But I think that sometimes when, because you're like isolated together, it's good to take like a softly, softly approach and also find an ally outside of the home, even that you're calling um, maybe someone who's like another family member, like an uncle or a coach or someone who can like intervene on your behalf, especially for LGBTQ, like for anybody who's going through that feeling that they don't have somebody who's accepting in their homes or for tr um, trans and non-binary um, students that they don't have a gender affirming a person in their home, um, there are resources online as well for like who to reach out to and how to kind of overcome that. And I can provide those as well. This question comes from a CMC student asking, how do you set boundaries when you're not sure of your own boundaries? Mm. How do you become aware of what your boundaries are? That's a great question. Um, normally I would say through experimentation and trial and error but we don't have the luxury of experimentation and trial and error right now. Um, maybe not in the way that we used to, but sitting with yourself, kind of that practice I mentioned of like actually sitting with yourself and thinking, what are my boundaries and trying to write them down. Like I'd, sometimes that helps making a list or imagining yourself in a situation. How would I respond? And sometimes by putting yourself in that kind of that role play exercise, you can start to figure out, you know, where you would fall. Um, but one of the issues with boundaries, and this is why like we learn through trial and error is because we don't know how we're going to feel until we are actually in that situation, experiencing it. Right. Um, but again, how, so how do we make, make sense of it now? Well, we, we have to kind of like create a simulation in our minds and see how we feel about things and talk them through with our partners, our friends, our families, our loved ones. That also helps to healthy dialogue about the boundaries and about these ideas. Um, and there, again, there's some resources online for that as well. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for oh, questions, man. but before we conclude, we want to give you the opportunity to share any parting thoughts with the audience. Oh, I just want to um, just say again, everyone, you are worthy of love, you are worthy of acceptance, and um, don't let anybody take that from you. Your, your sexual autonomy, your physical autonomy is yours, and um, you deserve ownership and joy in that experience, no matter who you are or where you're from. So. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Dr. Kelly Neff and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual AS event, which will be Tuesday, March 16th at 5 p.m. Pacific. 
Brian Stafford, the CEO of Diligent, will join us to discuss leadership that promotes diversity and inclusion. See you all then.